Hello and welcome to Supposedly Fun. My name is Greg, here to do a reading wrap-up for the month of April. We're into May, so that's what we do at this time. So in, in March, if you recall, I had a really hard time with reading, with everything going on in the world, and that kind of continued with April. Uh, that's how I started off the month. I'm still having a really hard time getting pretty much any reading done at all, and I've been really busy with work. Uh, you know, I, I'm lucky enough that I have been continuing to work full time, but in order to keep that, I've had to work really long hours, and uh, it that that has made things difficult as well because I don't have time to read during the week. Like last night, I finished work at 7:30 p.m., so that makes it difficult. So the only time I have to read is on weekends at the moment. But I can't complain because I'm working full time, and you know, <laughs> that is nice. So, you know, I did manage to finish four books in the month of April, which is nice. Uh, and I have a lot of books that I'm currently working on. So we'll get to both. Let's start with the ones that I read. First one I want to talk about, I mentioned briefly because I uh, this was part of my book haul for the month of April. And I already read it, so it gets to be in the book haul and the wrap-up, which is going to be really nice for my book haul revisits next year. It's My Brother's Husband by Gengoro Tsugame. This is volume one. I had started with volume one because I wanted to see if I was going to like it. I did, so I ordered volume two, which I'll get to in a second. Um, this is part of my Read Outside Your Comfort Zone challenge for this year, and I had never read a manga before, and that's why I wanted to do this. My approach to trying a manga was this, similar to what I did with Westerns earlier in the year. I picked one that seemed to align with my interests as a reader, and went with that. Um, I got a lot of really great recommendations for what to do for a traditional manga, uh, and thank you for those. If you have other recommendations, please drop them in the comments, and I will, I'm kind of considering them to try to figure out where I'm going to go next, but this one seems to align with who I am as a reader, and so I wanted to try that, kind of similar to how I tried a Western earlier in the year by, um, picking True Grit, and I'm currently reading Lonesome Dove, but I feel like at a, at a certain point I am also going to need to read some of a more traditional, um, like one of the popular consumer-driven titles, like maybe even a Zane Grey or a Louis L'Amour title, and I think I'm going to have to do the same with manga. I've tried one that would appeal to me and my interests, but I need to try one that would have a bit more of like mass appeal. So the premise of this is that Yaichi is living in Japan with his daughter. He is divorced, but is uh, the primary caregiver for their daughter. And he is estranged from his brother who has died. His brother had been living in Canada, and all of a sudden, Mike, his brother's husband, shows up at his door. And because it is custom and tradition, Yaichi is forced to invite Mike to stay with them while he is in Japan. And this forces Yaichi to confront the fact of his estrangement from his brother, which he didn't plan on, but kind of just happened, um, the latent prejudices that he had for his brother after his brother came out, and the sort of tacit, under-the-surface disapproval of the kind of life that his brother chose, and how, even though he loved his brother very deeply, it led them to this place where they were essentially strangers. It's a really well done story there's a lot of potential for it to be cliched or cheesy and it never really goes in that direction i, I really appreciated it i liked it a lot what i didn't know about it was that it's meant to be taken in with volume two which i have over here so the story kind of just ends a little bit abruptly not terribly abruptly but it kind of just ends at a certain point and you really need to continue the story in volume two to get the whole thing so i have not read volume two yet but i'm very much looking forward to it because i really really enjoyed it a lot i thought it was very smartly done very emotional uh, i really love the portrayal of the characters they all come across as complex um even the child you know she is basically just the, the cute child who doesn't understand to be prejudiced and yet she's done in a very smart way i think um and even she has layers because, you know, she's very accepting of things, but she kind of understands the emotional place that her father is in. It's a really cute relationship and dynamic that she and her father have. I would definitely recommend this. And part of why I was interested in this as well is that I'm kind of unfamiliar with what gay life in Japan is like. And um, Sean the Book Maniac has talked to me a little bit about that, but... Um, I, I, it's interesting to see it kind of portrayed in something. In fact, I think I... Um, I can't remember who I saw first, but it was Sarah from Hardcover Hearts mentioned this and Sean the Book Maniac did as well. I'm really glad that they did because it, I, I just really like it um, very much and I'm looking forward to reading volume two. 
So that's the first thing that I finished. The second, now if you followed along at all, you know that I've had a really hard time with mysteries and thrillers. Um, basically, what I've come down to, and I don't want to talk, spend too much time on this because I feel like I've talked a lot for anyone who follows. I don't like the state of mystery thrillers right now in the post-Gone Girl era. I feel like there's a lot of lazy repeating. Like I don't like the I don't like the trend that we're in right now, where you have these kind of they're very focused on plot twists and unreliable narrators and things like that. It's just not what I really like. Uh, and I feel like when you are really dependent on there being a twist and trying to fool your reader, I don't like that either you have to lie to your reader or misrepresent things, or there's a twist that just does not make sense. And because things are, they're so reliant on the twist, I feel like it becomes obvious anyway. So I've really struggled. Uh, I read some Sue Grafton books earlier this year. That's my comfort zone. And, and it was really refreshing um, to get back to those. I did do something else this month that was a mystery thriller and a little bit more in my comfort zone slash wheelhouse. I'll get to that one in a moment. So I had some trepidation with The Guest List by Lucy Foley. Uh, this is another book. I got it from Book of the Month and read it immediately. Uh, so it's another book that came into my library and was instantly read, which does not usually happen for me. So I'm really excited about that. So I had some trepidation, but I thought I wanted to try it because I, I needed something to jolt me out of the reading slump that I had been in. And, uh, you know, I read volume one of my, my brother's husband in a single afternoon. So that helped, but I wanted another win. So I decided to try uh, the guest list as well. And I'm glad I did. I think it has some problems. It's not a perfect book. It kind of falls into some of a little bit of cliches and things like that, but it's different enough that I enjoyed it. And it's there are, there's, there are enough clever aspects as well. So basically the premise is that uh, two people, uh, I'm blanking on their names, Jules Keegan and Will Slater, are getting married on a remote island in Ireland. Um, Will Keegan has a TV show that's kind of similar to Bear Grylls, uh, where he basically is sent out into the wild and uh, has to find his way back. And Jules is uh, a, owns a successful online magazine. So they're kind of high profile people, um, but at the wedding, you know someone is going to die. What's interesting about this, it was very much compared to Agatha Christie, and I'm always really suspicious of these comparisons, because I feel like they don't usually serve the book or the author, and it doesn't. Um, I don't think this is really an Agatha Christie type story, except that people end up on an island, <laughs> you know, which kind of has relations to, and then there were none. But it's not really like an Agatha Christie book, and I think the premise of and then there were none has been done a lot, but never as successfully. And to be fair, I don't think this is really trying to be And Then There Were None, but it, the comparison always feels weird, and that, that's all I mean to say by that. So one of the things that I thought was interesting about this is that you have all of these people who come to the island for the wedding, but we really only focus on the people who are close to the bride and groom, um, like very close friends or fa actual family, who are there the day before the wedding for the rehearsal and the rehearsal dinner and things like that. Those are That's kind of your core cast of characters. Um, those are the ones that you're going to follow. The, the novel um, moves back and forth among their points of view, but you don't actually know who the victim is going to be. Just usually you go into a book not knowing who the murderer is, and in the setup phase it's always really obvious. Uh, like I think of Agatha Christie where you know you you show up and uh, it's always obvious who the person is going to get killed is, and it's just kind of set up for that and then you go from there with the mystery. Um, in this, it kind of teases out the relationship between the characters, and that is actually one of the flaws, but I'll get to that. If you ever, have ever seen the TV show How to Get Away with Murder, it's a little bit like that. You move among the different characters a little bit back and forth in time, and it teases out details. Um, and then at a certain point, actually fairly late in the book, you find out who the victim is, and then of course once you know who the victim is, uh, it teases out who among the rest of the people committed the murder. And that's a really interesting approach for a book. I don't think it's always super successful, but I really appreciate it. And I think that is one of the, the strongest things that this book has going for it. Now, I mentioned uh, one of the weak points, and I think it's that Lucy Foley really wants all of the characters on the island to be connected. Um, and I can't talk about it too much, but I feel like there's a little bit too much effort 
to create a situation where everyone could be a suspect. And a little less of that would have gone a long way. I can't say too much more about it without spoiling a whole lot of the book. Um, but I did think it was fun. I think some of the characters are a, li a little bit lazy. Um, but other, there's enough strength in this book or enough strong aspects of it that I would recommend it. I think it was a fun book, especially heading into summer. If you're looking for a mystery thriller, it could be a fun read. Um, so there you go. I actually liked a mystery thriller. Who'd have thunk it? And then I actually uh, went... So I, if you listen to the podcast Criminal, which is hosted by Phoebe Judge, they're still doing new episodes because Phoebe is just recording them from home. But one thing that they started doing in the light of COVID-19 is they started a new podcast called Phoebe Reads a Mystery. And if you know the podcast, Phoebe has a very unique voice. It's just... I would almost recommend you just try an episode of Criminal just to hear her talk. She has a it has a really great, compelling voice. Sometimes when I'm working, I just put on an episode of Criminal just to kind of mellow, even if I'm not paying attention. It's just nice to hear her voice. Um, so they started with The Mysterious Affair at Styles, which is the first Hercule Poirot mystery by Agatha Christie. And I listened to it, uh, and it was interesting to do that, especially in conjunction with um, The Guest List, which is, was compared to an Agatha Christie novel. And I read Murder on the Orient Express maybe three years ago and really did not like it, like aggressively disliked it. And part of that, I think, is that Hercule Poirot was such a big outlandish character, but he also makes these really big outlandish leaps of logic that, you know, once you know the conclusion, they all make sense. But in the moment, it's supposed to be like, oh, but he's a genius. It's like, no, he's making a wild assumption that just turns out to be true. And it bothered me. And I think one of the things that makes The Mysterious Affair at Styles really successful is that Hercule Poirot is actually not the main character. He is a supporting character. It follows somebody else. There's an amateur, I think his name's Hastings, if I remember correctly. Um, he is something of an amateur sleuth himself, although he's terrible at it, which you find out as the, he kind of fancies himself uh, a sleuth but uh he is familiar with the work of hercule poirot so when he he visits a, a styles which is a country house um and a murder is committed and he's the one who brings hercule poirot in and you kind of follow him along and hercule is a side character and i think that tempers a lot of hercule poirot's personality and a lot of the leaps that he does um it turns out he was much more on the case. It, at a certain point, it seemed like he's not, he's not is going in the wrong direction. And of course, it turns out he was always in the right direction. But the, just the fact that you're following this character who is sort of as confused as you about what's going on or as in the dark, it really gave you a better access point. And I, I enjoyed it. I really, especially, it was a fun way to listen to it in podcast form, um, which is chapter after chapter. And usually they were very short. I think there was only one really long chapter. So it was a fun way of doing it. And she has, she has done, I think, at least one more book that's finished. And she, I don't know if she's finished the other one. So then she does The Hound of the Baskervilles. And uh, I believe she's doing The Moonstone right now. So I think I've never read an Arthur Conan Doyle book. So I think I'm going to continue and do The Hound of the Baskervilles. And I may continue into The Moonstone as well. I think it's just a fun way of following along with these. So <laughs> two mystery thrillers. One, one's classic, so it doesn't fit into the mold of mystery thrillers that have really um, caused me to struggle. Uh, but yeah, two in one go. There it is. And I listened to an audio as well for The Only Plane in the Sky, An Oral History of 9-11 by Garrett Graff. Uh, this was for the Booktube Prize, though, so I can't tell you about it. But I will. Uh, I believe this round of judging ends at the end of this month, so I and then it results in early June, so I will be able to tell you about it then. Um, I have already started <laughs> two other books for the Booktube Prize and need to get another three in before the end of May. So that's everything I have read. I read in the month of April: uh, My Brother's Husband, Volume One, The Guest List, The Only Plane in the Sky, and The Mysterious Affair at Styles. I'm still in the middle of a bunch of books. And I want to run through them uh, really quickly, just to, so you know what's coming up. This I should be finishing this weekend. It's The Glass Hotel by Emily St. John Mandel. This is a buddy read with Britta Bowler. Um, I will hold off on an opinion of it right now and until I finish it. Um, all right, I'll, I'll just say right now, uh, we're both very meh about it. And I started a buddy read. 
of Cloud Street with Sarah from Hardcover Hearts by Tim Winton. This was for Aussie April, but we're carrying it into the month of May, obviously, since we didn't finish it. And I have only read the first hundred pages, so I will hold off on speaking much about that, but you can anticipate a lot more about it. I'm also doing a slow buddy read of My Father and Myself by J.R. Ackerley with Sean the Book Maniac. Uh, we are doing basically two chapters a week, so I have to read another two chapters um, tonight or tomorrow to be ready for that. Um, so we're only, by the end of the weekend, there'll be four chapters in, and I, I, I can't remember what pace this means, if I'll finish it in the month of May or if it'll carry into June, but it's refreshing to be working on something at a really slow pace. And I have not gotten any reading done on Lonesome Dove, but I'm, I only have 100 pages left, I believe, and I'm really looking forward to being done with this. And uh, it'll be the first book I read for my Pulitzer Prize project. And it, I've been reading it for a long time at this point, but I'm still enjoying it. And I um, don't know how it's going to end, but I, I, given how much I've liked the rest of the book, I can only think that it would... Uh, be a very strong contender for one of my favorite books of the year. Uh, it, it will not be my favorite because there's another book I read this year that is already ahead of it. So that's what I read in April, what I'm carrying into May. Um, like I said, May, I, I'm going to finish these buddy reads up and then I have to get th uh, three additional books read for the BookTube Prize after I finish the two that I'm currently listening to. And that's my reading plan. I would love to hear what you read in April. If you've read any of these and you have thoughts about them, and I'd love to hear what you're planning to read in May. So, as always, thank you for your time. It's very much appreciated, and I will be back. Until next time, happy reading.